Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Optimalist, a podcast where we've set out to explore the optimal way to educate in the age of AI. If you are new here, or if you're not, I am Sarah Candela, and I am your host through this exploration of the elements of human flourishing. This week, I am bringing you a solo mini episode to start winding down the year. We haven't done one in a while, and we have a wonderful piece on reflective practice that our co-founder, co-CEO, Brian Lamb, wrote about a month ago that I've been waiting to, really, really waiting to kind of get on audio and record it for you all. And so it seems like a great week to do that. The week before Christmas, the week before the end of the year, um, a lot of people are putting out their end of the year stuff, their kinds of reflections, their lists. Here are the great moments from this podcast, from this blog, from this newsletter, from this show. Um, here are the things our team did this year. I thought of doing something like that and throwing together something kind of comprehensive and quick, but we've We've done a few things like that over the last few months as we've reached, this is episode 35 of the podcast. Um, we started in April, we're, we're going to end on 36 episodes for our first six months or so of being in existence in the world. And in that time, we have done, I think, two retro eps where we have gone, ew, I said eps, that's okay. Um, we have gone back and said, hey, look at the guests from the last 10 episodes, or hey, look at the guests from the last 20 episodes. So we've done that, and I'm not going to take the time to do that again for the end of the year because we're just going to push forward. And instead, I want to bring you our ideas about how we can push forward with our thinking about reflection. And if you've been listening, you've been reading, you've been following me on Twitter or, or Swivel on Twitter, and you've been paying attention to our shift from focusable to engageable to now the mirror concept and product and vision that we are putting out there. And all of that is encompassed in and around reflective practice becoming the core of how we think about our own individual growth, our students' individual growth, our collective growth as a community of learners, a community of educators, a community of human beings as we branch out into society. All of this is to say that the potential of reflection is our topic today. I don't want to go too crazy in into a longer introduction, but I hope everybody is winding down their year thinking about not just what has transpired throughout the course of the last 12 months of your life, but what also is your own potential that is bubbling up, that is boiling that is rising to the top. And I, I I like to not think of things, I don't know who else does this, let me know if you do, but when the year comes to a close, I tend to naturally not think of things winding down, but bubbling up. You know, like every every 12 months is a runway to the next thing. Like what's the next thing? You know, not a closing and an opening, but a continuation, a push forward, a flourishing. And so we think about potential like that that's what i think of i think of what's boiling up inside of you what is boiling up in your classroom what is bubbling in your students how can we not just continue what we're doing now next year but help to further realize the potential that we each have to be our best for ourselves and for each other and all that good stuff okay so we're going to do this solo mini episode this week and just as i said we're talking about the potential of reflection and this comes from an essay that Brian Lamb wrote for the Optimalist newsletter a few weeks ago that we just hadn't gotten a chance to create a mini episode for yet. And I then I realized, oh, you know what? Let's save it for the end of the year. And that would be perfect. So I'm bringing you the potential of reflection. Strengthening this loop on our thinking holds a whole lot of potential is the subtitle there. Okay. So how are we strengthening the loop of our reflective thinking so that we can fully realize our potential in 2024? And before I forget, there's a lot of stuff coming up for me from Swivel that has to do with reflective practice, with reflection as part of being adaptable uh, in the new year that um, a lot of you out there are involved in. So I'm excited to announce that as well at the end of this episode. So enjoy the potential of reflection. Can we take a moment to reflect? 
This statement is a normal thing for people to say, and not just in education. You hear it in any medium where people talk. And we say this because it mirrors how our minds work. We don't just think, we think in loops. We think, act, and feel, and we think about our thinking, actions, and feelings. And while it's a normal thing to say, educators and therapists figured out a long time ago that making it a conversation and structuring how we reflect improves our potential. Add in some prompts or questions, try to make it a daily routine, or add it as a routine built around learning experiences. It's also thought of as a skill. That's why it's often called reflective practice. If we can learn to narrate our actions and examine the results of them and explore our feelings about our experiences and envision what the future could look like, it is transformational. Our self awareness and our motivation advance exponentially. But structured reflection is not yet a routine for most of us. It's just too time consuming and relatively unenjoyable to do so. For example, the practice of journaling. And it's clearly not a skill that we possess at scale. Of course, people still think in loops because that's how our minds work. Some of those loops are bound to be constructive, but many are not. We ruminate, self-criticize, procrastinate, and make bad decisions that leave us out of alignment with who we want to be. This is what has us thinking about how to make the experience of reflection automated and more enjoyable with something like Mirror and socializing reflection for educators with something like reflectivity. You can find links to all of these, by the way, in our show notes at the end of this. And this also has us thinking, what might be possible if there were radically more and better reflection in education? And what if we produced radically better reflective skills as an outcome? Here are some of the potentials that we have been pondering. Learning acceleration. Educators already know that reflection improves outcomes. It's been established in a wide variety of studies. But what educators also know is that they do not have enough time to maximize reflection's potential, especially with each individual student. Removing the time barrier standing in the way of reflection is all that is necessary to unlock this potential. The only thing we don't know is just how far this potential can take us. The second thing is future-proof assessment. AI detectors do not work. This, plus the astonishing capabilities of AI, tempt students to take shortcuts and cheat. This is starting to make assessment harder than ever. On the other end of the challenge, educators will have to aim even higher to produce the skills that maintain our comparative advantage. And these new skills create new assessment needs and challenges. In both cases, shifting the basis of assessment to the reflection can help, as educators are already figuring out. From a reflection, you can determine if work was done or shortcuts were taken. You can also assess highly complex, rapidly changing skills. Reflection could be the future-proof way to assess all learning. Number three. Make grading obsolete. Extrinsic motivators like grades have always been necessary for our system of education to function, but we all dream of a system that does not rely on them. We want one that fosters true intrinsic motivation to drive results. What we've always been missing is a strong enough feedback loop on students' thinking to build the self awareness and ownership of goals that they need to do it. There isn't enough time and perhaps even enough educator skill to teach each student how to order their experience within the constraints of school, to help them find what motivates them beyond simplistic pre-existing interest. But now, this is possible. And with it, moving past traditional grading might finally be possible. The fourth thing is address mental health crisis. The mental health crisis is widespread at all ages. We know this, and it has made SEL initiatives a top priority for schools. There's a range of methods being employed, leveraging mindfulness and therapeutic practices. The results, however, have been mixed. Strengthened reflective practice is not often cited as part of the solution, but we think that this is an oversight. Reflection is the link between social, emotional, and cognitive development. 
and that link could be missing. It could be the missing link, so to speak, in addressing the mental health crisis. Instead of treating mental health separately from the things that motivate and create meaning for us, reflection integrates it. The next thing is goal alignment. You may have heard of the alignment problem and the debate about AI. This speaks to the challenge of making sure AI does positive things for us and doesn't harm, or in the extreme, destroy civilization. This is most often thought of as an engineering problem when making or testing AI systems, but AI mostly just does what we ask it to do. And the reality is that what makes goal alignment so hard is that we are not aligned within ourselves, our families, and communities. What we need for things with AI to go well is people who are goal aligned themselves. And reflection should be thought of as the, so to speak, original act of goal alignment. This is likely why it produces the outcomes it does in classrooms by aligning the goals of students and teachers together. And prioritizing greater skill of reflection can help educators contribute to this important societal challenge. Number five, more adaptable, optimistic people. The pace of change in society is accelerating and it will become less and less optional to keep up. But to live well, we need to be more adaptable than ever. Change for people is hard. And when change is required, it leads to resistance and the kind of pessimism that holds valuable progress back for everyone. The skill of reflection can help everyone develop the self-awareness and goals that they need to stay adaptable and optimistic for the path ahead. It can also, to bring us to the next point, address ignorance. There are a lot of takes on the roots of ignorance, and it fuels a lot of incredibly unproductive debate about education, thinking that it's always some lack of skill or knowledge that wasn't taught at some point. But the Dunning-Kruger effect has already shown us that a lack of self-awareness is what really fuels ignorance. It's not just some missing skill or knowledge. It's the lack of awareness of them, the disconnect between one's internal narrative and the external world. And for whatever reason, we just haven't connected the dots to reflection as the mechanism to improve it. Well, now is the time. Next comes more adaptable organizations. The rate of change in the world affects companies and institutions just as much as people. Those that adapt will survive and those that don't will go obsolete. And that likely includes some institutions that we would never consider able to go obsolete. I think it's fair to say that no organization can think of themselves as as immune at this point. And one of the best ways to enable adaptability and organizational thriving is by basing the culture of the organizations in which we work in reflection itself. As it turns out, the skills needed to flourish in the workplace are actually the skills that make us the most human. That brings us to the next point, develop future work skills. The future of work is nearly impossible to predict, if impossible to predict at this point as well. But that does not mean that we shouldn't try and that we won't try. In fact, it's imperative that we do. We know that the future will be nothing like today, and it's better to be wrong in the interest of being less wrong soon. So here is a prediction. The future of jobs will be one doing a rapidly shrinking set of non-automatable tasks. Two, giving goals to automated tools that require no special skills or knowledge to run. And three, reflecting on what you did to refine the goals, either individually or as a team. To put it more directly, individual and group reflection might just be the only skill that we can say will be required of future jobs. Lastly. Thriving in a post job world. Hmm. We might be getting a bit science fiction y with this one, but it is worth considering that the not so distant future might not include jobs for humans at all. Technology could do all the work once it gets intelligent and agentic enough. If true, to be healthy and happy, we will need to find the motivation to grow and develop ourselves as individuals and not get consumed by our consumption. 
and reflection can be the mechanism that helps everyone live optimally. So what potential do you see? Is there anything you would like to see us explore in a follow-up podcast, in a follow-up post, in The Optimalist as an article like the one I'm reading to you here, in a conversation on something like Twitter? What do you want to see? And what do you think? Drop us a note here in the comments, in any of the forums where you can be listening to this podcast, especially if you're listening to it on Substack, you can drop us a note right in the comments. You can also find us on Twitter and comment by using the hashtag optimalist whenever you post. And we just want to get this conversation started. Thank you to everyone who has been reaching out to us for feedback on the show. Please keep it coming. And also please consider letting us know what you think by leaving a review and even just a rating, which I think is just clicking on some stars in Apple podcasts. And you can also reach me on Twitter at scandela9, which is one L S C A N D E L A and the number nine. Um, as I mentioned before, the hashtag optimalist can be used when posting answers to questions we ask here or when you want to comment on something, especially if you are not using Substack and can't comment there. But if you just want to have a conversation out in the open about anything you hear here, you're here. You can use that hashtag on Twitter and I will be sure to see it. And so will our entire community. Actually, I can also be reached personally at Sarah at swivel.com. That is Sarah with no H S A R A at swivel S W I V L dot com. You can listen and subscribe to the optimalist podcast wherever you love listening to great podcasts. New episodes are released every Wednesday and links to all of the resources that you hear you're here again, are available in the show notes. The Optimalist Podcast is brought to you by Swivel. At Swivel, we understand that the biggest challenge in education is the rate of change. Policy revisions, technological advancements, especially ones accelerated by AI at this point, evolving job markets and ongoing research, constantly identifying new best practices are only some of the factors affecting the rate of change in education. To learn how Swivel can help you be more reflective, engaged, and adaptable, visit swivel.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Optimalist, and I will be back next week with a new conversation. Okay, heads up, Optimalists. At the beginning of this episode, I mentioned that I was going to be giving a a little sneak peek or a shout out to something at the end of the recording today that was going to be coming in the new year. I can't remember exactly what I said now at the beginning of this episode, but here is that sneak peek. So at the beginning of the new year, the second week of January, to be precise, I'm going to be debuting the new, what we're calling leadership panels. They're officially called adaptability in educational leadership panels. So I am going to be co-hosting these along with a upstanding member of our community, Sean Galliard, and we are going to be inviting leaders, many of whom have already volunteered their time to work with us in this initiative. We're going to be kind of putting them onto panels, a series of panel discussions, really, that are designed for leaders by leaders. And we're saying for leaders by leaders to unlock the potential of adaptive leadership. And so the idea here is that in many of the conversations that we've been having with school leaders this fall, especially in relation to this podcast, a common sentiment that has emerged is that not enough support exists for school leaders when it comes to being able to help their communities navigate change. Um, and so you just heard me, if you were listening to this podcast, talk about change. You hear me at the end of every episode now talk about the rate of change in education and um, how that's being accelerated with technology and AI and all of that. So what we want to do is be really helpful and aware that leaders need really good quality conversations and PD to be available to them at this time, just as educators do. And so the question is, how can we help teachers navigate complexity successfully without making sure that we as leaders are confident doing so ourselves? So 
this, like I just said, is especially important now in the age of AI. We need to be even better than ever at embracing change and being open to new ideas, experiences, etc. So here in these panels, our aim is going to be to provide the way, the way for those in positions of educational leadership to get the support, motivation, maybe even skills that they need to embrace the adaptability that is now needed to flourish in the modern world. So more information is coming soon, but the first panel is going to be starting on January 9th. There are going to be Tuesdays and Thursdays from January through March, and registration is going to be free. We have 17, 18, 19 leaders, all probably names that you might know and love, already signed up. So look for that information soon. Probably in the show notes of this episode, you might see a graphic that shows everybody that is participating as a as a panelist as of this moment. So um, that's my little sneak peek. Sorry if I blundered some things or kind of kind of just talking off the cuff here a little bit, but I am uh, very excited to be debuting this whole new series that is geared strictly for leaders um, in the new year. So coming soon to a webinar near you. (laughs) Okay. Have a good holiday, everybody.